There we go. All right. How's that? That cool. is great. And here we'll have you see our class and they can wave at you. Hi, everyone. So, that's so nice. That's great. Um, I, I know you are not here in person today, but maybe one of these days we might manage to drag you up. So I, right. I love that. And I'll tell this joke every time. I actually applied to CMU for undergrad and did not get in. So I take great <laughs> delight in, uh, in being able to speak to everyone about DBT. Uh, uh, really? And, and uh, would love to come. Would love to come someday. Uh, so hopefully this is fun. I've got my Apple Pencil here and I'm going to mark up uh, an iPad. And we'll kind of talk through what DBT is all about together. And I don't really have 10 minutes, so we'll make this quick. But my email address is just drew at dbtlabs.com. Feel free to shoot me an email if you want to follow up afterwards. Um, so this is kind of the state of the world uh, in most businesses. They have a set of data sources that they care about. This is application database, data, Postgres, MySQL, we have advertising da data and payments data coming from third-party services, telemetry logs, et cetera. And so a common practice is to extract data from these data sources and load it into a centralized data warehouse, where now you have all of your data in one place ready for analysis. So invariably, what happens is you've got this tight coupling between the data sources and the data warehouse. You're just extracting and loading data. And then people start building reports, where these different reports will query tables as needed to you know, report on the health of the business or the efficacy of some, some function like marketing or ad campaign performance or you name it. Okay, this becomes a total mess like very, very quickly because you will have hundreds of dashboards querying hundreds of data sets with no sense of governance or, or lineage or provenance where the data came from. Um, so here's one of the problems that you run into, right? Like there's no semblance of data lineage. And so if you look at a dashboard, you have no way of knowing where that data came from. And if, you know, this exact table that's powering an important dashboard for the business was updated this morning or five years ago, you just can't know from the system itself. Um, there's no data documentation. So when somebody wants to create, you know, a uh, product upgrades dashboard, they're going to go off and do all the same work themselves versus rebuilding on top of an existing asset because there is no existing asset. The only thing you can query is the raw data. There's no de deployment or CI CD process in place here. Effectively, everyone live edits in production as they update dashboards and cross their fingers, hoping that the SQL queries in their dashboards are correct. Um, this leads to broken dashboards, inconsistent numbers. Your stakeholders, like the people consuming this data, these dashboards don't trust you anymore because they keep seeing incorrect numbers and they just don't believe what they're seeing. So you've lost trust. So the big premise behind DBT is that we can you know, wrangle this system and, and make it more governed in a sense. And the big idea here is introducing a transformation step. So actually inside of the data warehouse, we'll create a left side and a right side. And the left side is going to be our raw data extracted and loaded into the data platform. And on the right side, what we're going to do is create derived data sets. So we call these DBT models and DBT parlance, but you can just think of them as views or tables created by the data warehouse itself. So actually what DBT does is uh, it executes something like a create table as expression to create a new table in the transformed you know, database or schema inside of the data warehouse that is an abstraction over the raw data itself. And so this means that the, da the dashboards for marketing, sales, and products can query kind of pre-built DBT models or tables, data assets, such that you can realize a lot of benefits. So... Each of these tables has a well-defined definition. It's a SQL select statement, and it's easy to update that select statement and make it do something different if your business logic changes. It's easier to understand how data flows because you can see exactly which source tables contribute to the underlying DBT models that power a dashboard. And importantly, you can develop in dev. So because we have this well-understood system, what you can do is build not to the production transformed database, but to a separate database, like for me, that would be dbt dbannon, and get an entire replica of the production data sets in your own sandbox environment. So now I'm developing in dev, I can uh, check out my changes, make sure that they work okay, and then create a, um, a pull request, as we'll see in a second, to update the code in production. We can also do interesting things that we won't have a ton of time to go into today, like find out if your data is broken before your CEO does. Uh, it is okay if data is broken. This happens from time to time. What's not okay is finding out about it from the CEO. That tends to make the CEO pretty upset when, when they're the reporter of an issue. And so what you could do with DBT is create data quality checks where you assert that, you know, 
order total should always be greater than zero or user ID should always be not null. And if ever you get errant data coming in through this extract and load process, or maybe a transformation model doesn't do what you expect it to do, you can be alerted of that. So you can take action and fix it. Unless, and maybe, maybe importantly, you can reuse these assets instead of rebuilding them. So here we see this imaginary model is consumed by a few different dashboards. This means that you've defined one asset that has multiple use cases versus you know, this example where every single dashboard has to reinvent the wheel to define business logic for your core data assets. So I'll take a look at um, what a typical DBT model looks like. And there's a couple things to see here. So first of all, this is just a SQL file in a GitHub repository. So by choosing to define DBT models, kind of transformation logic as code, we get all the benefits of a mature software development workflow. This is version control, it's CICD, it's automated testing documentation. And really, this is just a select statement. Here you see kind of a, a common table expression if you're familiar, but it's just a select statement. And the secret sauce is um, this Jinja Teflon language. So here, I don't know if it's big enough for you to see, but this is a function that says source. And so what the source function does is it creates a link between a source table loaded into the data warehouse and some downstream DBT model. And so now we have this sort of parent-child relationship in a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, where we can understand that data loaded in the source table flows through to this model where it's later queried by, by a BI tool. And now you can start to understand that if your source data is delayed or if your source data has an error, and its logic, you can understand and trace that impact downstream to all the other tables that are impacted. Otherwise, this is just a standard SQL select statement. And so this makes DBT very accessible to very many people. I understand that everyone in this classroom is extremely technical and smart, um, but out in the workforce, you're gonna find that there are people who are not programmers who still play a role in data. So by choosing SQL as our kind of primary language for transformation, this means that really anyone in the organization can look at a SQL select statement and understand the business logic behind some critical transformation. Last, I just want to show you kind of what we can do with this lineage information. So this is a, a clip from our internal analytics, um, like DBT Labs' data practice. And so here we can actually see like how Salesforce data flows through an intermediate model into our DIM Stripe customers model. So DIM here means it's a dimensional model. This is like a Kimball style thing. If you've never heard the word Kimball, I'm happy for you. Um, that's amazing. But this ends up being pretty common in, in sort of the enterprise, the idea of creating dimensional tables that represent entities and, and fact tables that represent events, and then being able to sort of join those two things together. Um, so this is a well-governed, well-understood data model that we can use to power our payments reporting in this case. And again, if there's an issue here, we can understand the exact impact that we'll have by tracing the lineage through the DBT DAG. And we can report out to the business, hey, our payments data is in bad shape because of an upstream problem. Check back in an hour. Um, that is the eight minute version of what DBT is all about. It is uh, applying business logic in the data warehouse. We work with all the leading cloud data platforms out there. And um, the last thing I want to plug is that we recently acquired a company called uh, SDF. And SDF is really, really, really cool. I hope that they have a chance to speak to you someday about their technology. They do a lot of SQL comprehension and parsing and understanding, and we can use this. Uh, we can use this knowledge of what your SQL query is actually doing to make DBT even smarter and better. And if that kind of thing is exciting to you, I'd, I'd love to chat about the the SQL parsing work we're doing. Feel free to shoot me an email. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Are you guys hiring? We are. We are hiring. Um, I can follow up with an email with more information, if that's helpful. That sounds great, yep. Uh, 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 and we'll send you along some information back. Uh, so uh, questions. I have a question. Uh, this is obviously fascinating. I know a lot of students here are seeing this for the first time. Uh, the, the question was, do you support or do you see cases where someone wants to apply these transformations across different databases, like maybe a table coming from MongoDB, another one coming in from Postgres or something else like that? And uh, what do you do if you if you have something like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So typically what we recommend is that this sort of extract and load process takes the data out of Mongo and out of Postgres and loads it into somewhere central, like 
a cloud data warehouse. Um, can I say vendor names? Am I allowed? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. So Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, Databricks, uh, Trino, Starburst, like there's a ton. Some are open source, some are, are SaaS proprietary. Um, but if you have one place where all your data lives, then that's magical. Now, what I will quickly say is there's this open table format called Iceberg that yep. is building a lot of steam. Iceberg makes it possible for these different data platforms to interoperate. And I think that's going to be a big deal over the coming 12, 24, 36 months. That totally makes sense. That'll make all of this even more exciting. Wonderful. I know the next class is starting to come in over here. Drew, real pleasure to have you here. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. having me on. Take care. Yep.